Hi everyone, thank you for joining me again. We're going to talk about an acute heart failure case today, um, thinking about things as they go along minute by minute. So let's get straight into the case. We have a 70 year old male. His wife called an ambulance as he was unable to get out of his chair today. He's had progressive shortness of breath at rest over the last three days. My wife says that his legs are swollen and that he's been dragging his feet along the floor when he does walk. For the last three to four weeks, he's had difficulty walking and increasing difficulty getting out of that chair. And he's been coughing up clear sputum for a bit longer than that. He's got no fevers, no, um, no bladder pain, pain anywhere else, any other infective features, no coughs, colds or sniffles. He's been unable to lie flat for about a month and he's using three pillows when you ask and you do need to ask specifically. He also wakes up short of breath in the middle of the night and has to sit upright for relief. And that's kind of your classical paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. He's got no other systemic symptoms. So looking backwards, he had an MI three years ago and he had intervention for left anterior descending artery disease. He's got diabetes type two. He doesn't take insulin and he's got CKD. His drug history, he, he takes clopidogrel, a statin, ranipril, bisoprolol and metformin. Now you really do need to ask these patients about whether they're taking their drugs, how much um, and how often they're, they're taking and any recent changes. Worth looking at recent admissions to see if other people have been tinkering with the drugs as well. So asking him all this would tell you that he's not been taking his ramipril recently because it makes him cough. In terms of social history, uh, he's got a 40 pack year history of smoking. He's normally pretty independent living with his wife. He's a retired mechanic, doesn't eat very well. He drinks half a bottle of wine most nights and he can walk at the moment about 40 meters on the flat without stopping and even less on, on an incline. So here's our man. So we're going to do our A to E assessment. He's, his airway is patent. Breathing is difficult. He is sat bolt upright with his arms extended, a kind of a classic tripod position. When you listen to his chest, he's got crackles up to the mid zones. Sats are 88% on Romare. Respiratory rate is 34. So we're going to put him on some oxygen via a non rebreather for the low sats and the fact that he's showing some respiratory difficulty. Circulation to so, um, heart sounds. He's got an extra, uh, he's got a murmur, grade three bit tachycardic, blood pressures 105 over 88. His JVP is up and he's got pitting edema to the mid thighs, capillary refill three seconds. So he's perfusing for the time being. So we're gonna gain access and uh, get some bloods and take a VBG. Why are we gonna do this? Well, so that we can have a look at his lactate, make sure there's no horrendous um, anemia and make sure there's no electrolyte abnormalities. Moving on to D, uh, his GCS is 15, pupils are fine. Got to do a blood pressure and that's okay as well, 8.2. And everything else, we can see a bit of venous eczema on the medial lower limbs. And um, when we feel his calves, they're soft and non-tender. So no suggestion of an enormous thrombosis. Quick diagnosis here. Well, this is pulmonary edema. Your main clues are his, um, his chest signs. He's, coarse crackles up to the mid zones and that respiratory difficulty. So how are we going to classify this? So he's got a, a good history for heart failure. So let's think about the four types. So most commonly we see them as being warm and wet. So warm in that they have adequate perfusion and wet in that they've got these, these higher filling pressures and that's leading to, to this edema picture. About 20% will be cold and wet. So they've still got the same kind of overload type symptoms, the high JVP, the crackles and so on, but they're not perfusing properly. So that cap refill will be prolonged, a lactate on an ABG or VBG will be high and so on. On the other side, we've got the warm and dry and cold and dries, and these are about 10% of the cases. And these are patients that either have adequate or poor perfusion, but have reduced filling pressure. So the heart's not pumping adequately, but they're, they're the filling pressures are low as well. So what do we need to do now? 
So the patient's on a non-rebreather, 15 litres. We've got his VBG and have a look at his oxygen levels and his lactate, and we're going to send some blood. So the usual bits and pieces, full blood count, biochem, CRP and cultures. Look at his thyroid function. Need to assess his lipid profile. BNPs, uh, the important one here, brain natriuretic peptide, and we'll get a blood glucose. An ECG, we absolutely need an ECG, and an X-ray will be useful. Troponins um, only tend to be useful in heart failure if the patient's got chest pain or ECG changes and you're looking for a large rise. Small rises are pretty common with heart failure and may not necessarily point you in the right direction. If you have someone available and a machine, then a bedside echo, if you have that luxury, then absolutely. So what we want to do is confirm this is an acute CCF and then look for the underlying causes. So we know with our man, he's got risk factors for ischemic heart disease and that history, but there's lots of other precipitating factors that are possible. So let's think about causes and precipitators. So causes are the direct things that, um, that lead to heart failure. So coronary disease, high blood pressure, cardiomyopathy and valve disease, diseases of the pericardium. Iatrogenic's a big one that um, often forgotten. So chemotherapy is a big example. Um, arrhythmias and alcohol as well. Alcohol excess can cause a cardiomyopathy and cause heart failure. Your precipitators, and these are things that will tip someone over the edge into heart failure. So infections, arrhythmias can do it, um, and hypertension as well if uncontrolled. Uh, pulmonary emboli, poor drug adherence and changes in drugs, uh, giving too much fluid, and a diet high in salt um, and or alcohol. So let's have a look at an ECG. So I'm gonna give you five options, then show you the ECG. We've got two features out of these. So have a look at your options, and then I'll give you 10 seconds with the ECG. You can, of course, just pause the presentation and have a look. So the answer here is that we've got an aspect of left bundle branch block. That's visible, just that, that widening in um, V5 and V6, and left ventricular hypertrophy. If we're looking at voltage criteria, we can see the, um, the waves in V2 and V5, and they, um, they definitely meet voltage criteria here. And this looks like a bit of a strain pattern as well in that ECG. Let's have a look at the X-ray now, the other big test we need to do. So which of the below features do you see? So in this one, I would say that um, he probably does have cardiomegaly, although you need to assess whether it's AP or PA. Curly beads I can't see without zooming in. Um, can't see fluid in the fissure, but there are definitely some mild effusions, some upper low blood diversion, and the hyla look a tiny bit bulky to me as well. Blood tests. So your VBG came back, the oxygen level is 13.1, and that's on 15 litres of oxygen, and a lactate of 2.9. So a little bit high, but not very. Full blood count, hemoglobin is okay, slightly low. Other things look okay. And the use and ease. So sodium 129, does that bother us? Well, not too much. He's not symptomatic. And once he's started diuretics after this, this kind of sodium definitely won't bother you. LFTs look okay. Bone profile again looks fine. So in green we've got the tests that will come back immediately, in blue are the ones that will come back later on, so they're not acutely um, helpful. But we do find out that his blood cultures are negative, his thyroid function was normal, cholesterol was high, and that's either going to be due to him not taking a statin as well, or it could well be his alcohol. And importantly, the, um, the BMP test that we do, the NT Pro BNP, is 2,655, and we know that over 2,000 means that heart failure is likely. So which treatment to give first? So I'll give you a few seconds to have a think. I am going to go with option B, IV frusamide. So we need to offload this edema quickly. The first line drug for that is loop diuretics. Intravenous is better. 
that's because if there's fluid in the legs and there's fluid in the lungs, then there's likely to be fluid in the bowels, which will make absorbing things more difficult. Nitrates are rarely used these days unless the patient is also hypertensive. You need to closely monitor them, titrate the oxygen over 94% and consider supporting with CPAP or NIV if you don't get any improvement in that respiratory function. So when you see a patient like this, just have at the back of your mind which areas of the hospital this can be done in and who you need to speak to. So if this is someone you're seeing in the LRI, then you need to decide, are you going to speak to ACB? Are you going to get them to the Glenfield? Just have this on your radar. You want to weigh them initially, so an admission weight is really important, and then we can weigh them daily afterwards. And you need to do a really, really uh, good fluid balance. So if you can rely on bottles, then great, but more often than not, you may find that you're catheterizing patients just to get that really accurate level. So how much diuretic, the big question. So we've decided we're gonna give furosemide as our upfront treatment for this. So we start with 50 milligrams stat of IV furosemide and we titrate from there. If they're already on a diuretic and they come in, you're gonna convert that drug to IV and double the dose and give that. Remember that low EGFR patients may require higher doses of diuretics, not lower doses. This is definitely something that will need um, a bit of senior input. And for that urine output that really is critical, your aim is for about 500 mils over the first two hours and then a steady state after that. And your overall aim with these patients is to try and lose about a kilogram daily, or you can think about that alternatively as one liter negative balance. And if you're not achieving that, then you need to titrate your medications accordingly. So investigation. So we've stabilized the patient. He's had loads of furosemide um, and started to offload and we're, we're on track. So now we need to have a look at how to follow him up. So an echocardiogram will tell us about his, um, his function, his ejection fraction, and then we can stratify him into see someone with reduced ejection fraction, um, mid-range ejection fraction or, um, or HEF-PEF uh, preserved ejection fraction. And it does matter because each of those will have slightly different long-term treatment techniques. The echo will show you the condition of the valves. And remember, our man did have a murmur and I'll show you structural problems as well. Cardiac MRI is the investigation of choice for showing perfusion of cardiac muscle can help um, prove that he's had previous infarctions. These are usually done as an outpatient, mainly because the inpatient waiting list is, is pretty long. And we can do angiograms. If we thought our man was having an acute infarction, then we would do an inpatient angiogram. So ongoing management, I tend to think of as either medical or lifestyle. So medical, so um, hopefully you'll know some of these ACE inhibitors, and beta blockers, he's already on these, um, aldosterone antagonists, so things like spironolactone and aplerinone, a loop diuretics, um, so he'll probably go home with some kind of frusamide regime. Do note that whilst the above are proven to prolong life in these patients, loop diuretics are good for symptoms, but they don't have an effect on overall mortality. The new kid on the block is Secubitril Valsartan, and that's now been given as first line for um, reduced ejection fraction. And so Secubitril is a neprolysin inhibitor. So this inhibits the enzyme that breaks down atrial natriuretic peptide and brain natriuretic pep peptide. Other options, digoxin, ivabradine, um, cardiac resynchronization therapy, all of these things are possible and will be done with specialist input. Lifestyle, just as important. So blood pressure control, glucose and lipids, uh, low sodium diet and reducing his alcohol. So kick the booze and do some exercise. And he needs a really clear conversation about taking his medications and what to do if he has side effects. So your aim for discharging these patients is on the, at the very least, they should be on an angiotensin drug and a beta blocker. They should be stable off their IV diuretics for 24 to 48 hours with no weight gain and you need to have the heart failure team on board. So that's done via ICE and they can arrange follow-up. That's it for now. So we're gonna to return to some of the other acute heart failure scenarios in another video 
and get into some more depth. Meanwhile, the, uh, the cardiology handbook's available in the guidelines and BMG Best Practice actually has a pretty good summary, so recommend that. Thank you for listening and please do subscribe if you haven't already.